Hi, my name is Robert, and I'm an entrepreneur. Growing up, I had both parents in the household. I'm an only child. My mother was 40 years old when I was born, and my father was 55. Um, so what that was like growing up was my parents were like all my friends' grandparents' age. Because I was an only child, though, I had <laughs> to be really creative. So my mom allowed me to do anything and everything that I had in my imagination, and she encouraged it. So it was painting or drawing or dance or magic or any sport she went full-fledged at supporting me in that thing. But that's the kind of mom that she was. She was always like, well, if you made it, we're wearing it, we're supporting it, we think it's the greatest thing ever. It was that like insane level of belief in me. My mom was like a community mom for everybody in the neighborhood. She was always home. She had a stay-in-the-home job. She took kid, care of kids after school. So she would pick up students from school and help them with their homework until their parents were able to pick their kid up from our house. Um, and because she, care so much about kids, it kind of transferred into me. Um, so I had like a, a passion for helping students with homework or encouraging them when, you know, they were frustrated with something going on in school or trying to make sure they weren't getting in trouble in school like a big brother because I didn't have any siblings. They became like my extended family. So in high school, my crew that I ran with, my best friends, had one super talented music guy. He was able to listen to any song and figure out how to play that song on a piano or a keyboard. He was a church musician, he played drums, he played guitar, I think he played the bass. Over time, he started being passionate about making music, like making beats, and I thought he was great. So as a friend, I was just encouraging my friend, like, keep doing it, I think that's crazy. You could be like the next Timberland. That's how good he was to me. Um, and he started getting frustrated that people were not taking him serious, and he wasn't finding the right artist to put over beats. He didn't know what studio to work with. Um, so I used my gift of gab maybe, like I was really talkative and kind of networking well, to find other artists. And I started selling his beats for a little chunk of the profit um, and leasing beats. From that, we started making some money and meeting new artists and local artists that are now really big. But at the time, it felt like we were winning and about to blow up. So it was me and him. And then we found some other really talented people who liked what we were doing and the energy of the, um, of the business and we created a team. And the idea was to be like Bad Boy, back when Bad Boy was hot, and like uh, No Limit, when it was a team of people with a CEO and some in-house producers, that's what we thought we were gonna do. Blow up independently, get a deal, and everybody just be superstars. And it looked like it could happen. We had a studio we had access to. Um, I learned how to engineer sessions. Um, the beats were coming out great. Um, some of the, the songs that we had were actually getting a little notoriety. We put out mixtapes and this was before everybody was doing mixtapes. We would put our song next to like the Bad Boy song or next to um, the Biggie song or the Tupac song and slide these songs in a mixtape right next to them. And no one was arguing like, ah, oh, who are these people? They just thought it was a new artist. But because we didn't have the money, everybody was still looking for their own success route and they didn't really stick to a team. So what that led to is the team kind of separating a little bit, but me and another member of the crew uh, staying a team. Um, so while I was in college, me and this new business partner um, started meeting like Teddy Riley of Guy, um, sitting in sessions with like, R&B superstar legend producers and writers and artists. Um, and from Teddy Riley, it went to Tyrese, and from Tyrese it went to um, like Glenn Lewis, um, somebody I was listening to as a, a high school student. And then from there, it went to another like superstar level team of producers and writers that I secretly wanted to be like. Like when we had our first business planning meeting, I wrote down like three producers, one team. That team is where we went to. So like I was like, we're about to blow up. The business partner was an amazing writer. Um, he had a, a, a really nice voice. He could demo songs or write his own songs. Um, I was working on production, but I had a 
a business plan. And together, we were gonna keep the idea of winning together. Um, so successfully, he took off. He wrote some major hits for major artists on major <laughs> labels. And I became a personal assistant and had a key to a major studio where major hits and major artists were coming through. So I signed some artists, I created an LLC business, and we were working with our artists while he was working um, for these major superstars. So the, the idea would be, he blows up, we all blow up, and we can blow up with our artists. Um, but he blew up so big that he literally says, I'm too busy for this idea no more. Like I can no longer spend time working on these developing acts. I gotta go here and fly here and I'm in the studio, so I don't have time for this. So um, as things started developing, working as a personal assistant for one of my idols in music, um, I found out that I was about to have a son with my girlfriend at the time that I was madly in love with. Um, but the challenge with that was, it wasn't enough to really be the kind of father and provide the way I wanted to. I had to provide and feed and clothe and shelter another life other than myself. So it made it that more urgent to find the next level of success and kind of take some strides in the right direction. My mom had always struggled with like her health, but uh, the same year that my son was born, um, I found out that my mom had stage four breast cancer. Um, and finding out like what that meant put a time limit on how much time I had with her um, and how much time I had to show her success. And my decision was um, to work harder because I had like a, a blind hope that maybe she would stick around forever and I can show her that all the stuff that I had been working on and the things that she had believed in me was worthwhile and I was about to get this deal, I was gonna sign a publishing deal, a production deal, and be able to help. Um, we found out in May, she passed away in August. So literally months after finding out that she had cancer, she was gone. Um, and I didn't know what to do. The guy that I was a personal assistant for uh, was going through his own hardships. His accounts had got frozen for like child support or something. I never found out what was really going on. I just found out that my checks had stopped. Um, but I didn't stop going to work. I kept going, expecting like one day, you know, he'd just be like, here's some cash. But I didn't want to not go because that meant a lot. My key to the studio would be taken if I didn't handle it right. My relationship with my business partner might be strained because uh, he was working in the same studio. Um, being able to eat that day might have not happened if I didn't go to work. Um, but I had to beg for money to go to my mom's funeral to be able to bury her and fly to that place. Um, and that was like the last amount of money. When my mom passed away, I think I went into some form of depression. I felt alone, I felt angry. I was saying I was okay when I really wasn't okay. Um, I was saying I didn't need anything when I really probably needed a lot. I just didn't know how to articulate it or if I should, if it would be worth it or who would listen. Um, but that was the result of that time period. Um, she was the most important person in my life. So when the music industry dream kind of was deferred a little bit, I was like, okay, I'm gonna start my own nonprofit or maybe come up with a for-profit business plan and charge schools for these after-school music programs and after-school male mentorship programs and talking about race and inclusion and identity. Um, but every contract that I got, not one school paid for like eight months. So I was starving, <laughs> literally starving, not able to, to eat without borrowing money from like kind of friends, like not even close friends. My gift was my son. I had to keep some level of sanity, um, and I also had a bunch of equipment. I had a computer, um, I had all the sounds that the amazing super producers were using, all the software they were using. So one day, with my son, I was annoyed. I was like, I hate how I can't listen to the radio with my son, but I love the energy of the radio songs. But I don't like the little kids' music. I didn't like, it felt corny. Like especially the hip-hop stuff, it was like, oh, this is hip-hop kids' music. It didn't feel like hip-hop. It felt like 
someone who was not hip hop making hip hop. So on a fluke, I was like, I'm gonna make one for my son. And it turned into the ABC song. I was like, it's gonna be a way for him to practice and brainwash him with the ABCs, with a hip hop beat. And I made it and he came over and I played it for him and he was dancing around the house and I was like, what? And uh, one of my closest friends at the time, he was like, you should just do like more of these. And I was like, for what? Like, I don't know, like, this is for Rob, this is for my son. He's like, well, I'm sure that we know at least 10 parents who would like this because everybody he played for liked it. So I said, all right, well, boom, light bulb went on. Let me just do an album. I don't know where I'm going to put it. I'm just going to do an album and see who'd buy it, who I knew who'd buy it, and if they tell somebody about it. So in my little small apartment, in my father's two-bedroom in the hood, I went to work. And I drew a cartoon character from all the drawing and painting classes my mom put me in. Created a character. Um, my son asked me, and some friends asked me, well, what are you gonna call the character? I was like, it's just a robot. It's a friendly, like it's your pal, it's your buddy. I called it Buddy Bot mistakenly one day, and they were like, that sounds like a name. Let's roll with that. And I put it on iTunes, and I put it on YouTube. And by this time, like all the people around me were like, cheering and excited like what's up with this and when you gonna have that and just really cheering me on and I kind of forgot that I was upset and mad uh, I forgot that I wasn't eating maybe enough times a day and not getting enough rest and not having peace of mind because it felt right I was just working having fun like I was when I first started doing both either business and music or working in the community and I put up a music video for it crudely made, didn't know what I was doing, just put it up, and in one day it had like 2,000 views. Like a month it had like 6,000 views. I'm like, I'm not even really telling anybody, who do I know, who's watching this, I don't know what's going on. But like the, the engine was, was moving without me, I didn't have to market it a lot, it just was people talking about it. And now I'm proud to say that if it wasn't for that idea, I wouldn't have survived. I wouldn't have survived psychologically. I wouldn't have survived. And selling hand-to-hand -hand out the trunk of the car and a backpack at a school or at a church, um, all the moms and grandmas and aunties and big brothers and cousins buying little $5, $6 CDs helped me eat and feed my son right there, like that little period of time. Um, and while I was doing that, I got an opportunity to use my experience working with young people to help the community, but at the same time giving it to the community helped me. Like seeing young people learn something and kind of get through some of their frustrations on campus or in their community was feed my soul. Even though the check was small, it made me feel good. The song from the bedroom for my son now has f almost five million views. The album, I don't even know how many downloads we have or how many streams of certain songs in the album but independently, no team, just me and word of mouth, it's been pretty successful. I've recorded a new album with Buddy Bot's friends. I'm about to show the world his friends in the next two months. So a song turned into a business, all because I kept trying and I didn't give up and I kept pursuing the things that I felt like I was good at and I should be doing, um, but I didn't see any of this. Um, before the struggle or while in the storm of the struggle. If there's something that you want out of life, the same thing that my mom taught me, it's the same thing I tell my son and same thing I tell anyone who listens. If there's something that you want out of life, even if you don't know how you're gonna get the things that you want, start doing the work. Figuring it out is a part of the journey and it's worth it. And it might not look exactly how you thought it was gonna look, but if you want it, going after it is worth it. And you can get anywhere you see yourself going to. You can be exactly what you want. You can be successful. You could be married. You can have wealth. You could be famous. Any of the things that you want, you can have, even if there's no one there to show you how to do it, even if there's no blueprint. Figuring it out is the beauty of the journey. And the struggle actually taught me a lot. And it's going to teach you 
a lot. Don't be afraid of the things that you don't know and the things that will come and the things that other people might have to say. Um, if you want it, go get it. 